a God of mercy. Last Lord's Day morning, we uh, looked at verses 7 to 14 in chapter 63, and there Isaiah recounts and recalls and reflects and meditates and, and challenges us to, to make uh, times of quiet in our lives when we think about the mercies of God. He reminds us uh, what the prophet Jeremiah reminds us, his mercies never cease, they're new every morning. Oh, Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the, the house of the Lord forever. Oh, that great verse in Micah chapter 7, for He is a God who delights in mercy. Or verse 7 of chapter 63, I will recount the mercies or the steadfast love of the Lord. That was the theme of our uh, message uh, last week. And so, Heinrich Heine might have sounded rather flippant, but did he have a point? Is it God's job automatically to forgive us? Or was he relying on a half-truth, grasping after comfort, but finding no certainty. Can we take God's mercies for granted? Many people do. Even today in a very secular world where many people don't even believe in a God, imagine that if there is a God, He has to be, He just has to be the kind of God who would automatically forgive everyone. Now, for very different reasons, many people in Isaiah's day, in the nation of Israel, took God's mercies for granted. It's not a new problem. It's an age-old problem. And that's why Isaiah's calm meditations in uh, that middle section of chapter 63 gives way to a, a passionate plea for God to show mercy, and also to His fellow Israelites not to take God's mercies for granted. That's the theme of these verses that we look at, of this section of Isaiah's prayer, where Isaiah's calm prayer turns into a turbulent cry from the heart. And in these verses, what Isaiah does is he, he, he looks he turns his attention to the obstacles that stand in the way of God's mercies, and they're significant. They're the things that hold back or restrain. They're blockages. You know when someone uh, eats their food too quickly and they get something stuck in their windpipe and they can't breathe? There's a blockage. It's a serious problem. So, the, the first responder has to come and do something really serious, you know, thump them in the back or uh, pull them in their chest and to get the blockage out, because that's serious if there's a blockage that you cannot breathe. Or it, when our water pipes, maybe some of them, the old pipes cave in, and people panic. There's no water in the taps. They get on to Josh here or someone from Bar One Water, come and unblock the pipes. We need water. We need to have a shower. Come, clear the pipes. In our economy, there are blockages, constraints. You may have noticed that prices are going up, prices of almost everything. We're facing what some people call a cost of living crisis. Many items are hard to get, and if you get them, they're more expensive. The pandemic has shut down factories in China. Uh, the war means that farmers can't export wheat from Ukraine, and even if they can get it out, the ships are in the wrong place, the containers are piled up in the wrong place. Uh, there are blockages in the supply chains that stop goods getting from the, the supplier to the customer. There are blockages, constraints. Uh, they hold things back. Everyday things become more expensive. That's bad for us, but spare a thought for those in the Middle East and Africa who cannot at any price get the things, the basics that they need. Constraints that hold back what we need. It's there, but it can't get through. 
Now, that, that's what Isaiah has in mind. And in fact, it's an even more serious set of blockages and constraints. It holds back God's mercy from flowing to His people Israel. And this has eternal spiritual consequences. Now, notice how this section that we're looking at this morning uh, really focuses on that theme. It begins, uh, 63 verse 15, the stirring of your inward parts and your compassion. In other words, God's, God's gut mercies, God's compassions that He feels uh, almost physically, viscerally, are held back or restrained. There's a blockage. There's something holding them back. And then the very last verse, the same, uh, and it's an unusual expression. It's, it, it's, a, it's a very arresting one. It only occurs, I think, twice or three times in the whole of the Old Testament, but it's the same one, and it's here. Will you restrain yourself? Will you hold back yourself, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us so terribly. So, I want to suggest that between these two brackets, Isaiah is describing what it is that holds back God's mercies. He's horrified. He identifies them, and he pleads with God to act, and he records his prayer for us so that we might have a better understanding, that we might pray as Isaiah prays. So, three things we want to notice that hold back God's mercy. One is hardened hearts, a second is religious complacency, and the third is accumulated gatherings of sin, the sin that builds up. So, let's look at them in order. First of all, hardened hearts. Now, the, the key verse in this section, 63 verses 15 to 19, is verse 17. I just want to highlight, we'll, 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 we'll come to that, but you'll see how God Oh, sorry, how Isaiah pleads to God, look down from heaven, uh, God's vantage point, uh, look down, where are your zeal, where is your might, the, the stirring of your inward parts, your compassions, your mercies, why are they held back? And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pointed question because God is a Father, you are our Father. You, and he says it twice, you, Lord, are our Father. He's a good Father. And that's a very reassuring truth to grasp, and we need to, to hold it. Remember how Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you then who are evil know how to give good things to your children, he's talking there about human fathers, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Notice the importance of asking. And many Israelites regarded themselves as children of God. They also regarded themselves as children of Abraham. Is not Abraham our father? But Isaiah says, Abraham doesn't know us. Israel, and that's Israel, the father, Jacob, the father of the twelve tribes, he, he doesn't acknowledge us. They can't help us. They're not here. They can't do anything for us. But you are our Father. You are the one to whom we look. You are our God. And, and, and when we come to verses 18 and 19, uh, Isaiah speaks almost as though that special relationship is slipping away between their fingers, the way sand slips through our fingers. Your holy people held possession for a little while. In other words, we've been in the land, we've been enjoying God's blessing for a little while. Now, when Isaiah wrote those words uh, that children of Israel had been in the land for 500 or more years, now that's, that's more than twice the length of time that Europeans have been settled here in Australia. So, think about that. And yet Isaiah says, your holy people have held possession a 
little while and our adversaries are trampling down your sanctuary. We are becoming like those over whom you never ruled. We're, in other words, we're becoming like the heathen. I mean, that's a serious thing to say. We're becoming like people who never knew the gospel. Can you see the parallels with modern Australia? A country where the gospel was preached with great power over many years where uh, even as recently as, as the 50s, almost every child went to a Sunday school, yet we're becoming like a nation where God was never known. And Isaiah is crying out in similar circumstances. Where are you, God? Why? And that's where we come to the question at the heart of the passage, verse 17. And it wasn't an easy question to ask. In fact, it sounds more like an accusation. Why? Why? Just listen to the question. Why do you make us wonder? Why do you make us wonder? Uh, from uh, your ways and harden our hearts. He's saying, God, why are you causing us? That's why I say it sounds like an accusation, doesn't it? What's going on here? The Lord has hardened their hearts. He has caused them to wonder. He has caused their hearts to harden. And that's a major obstacle to God showing mercy because their hearts are hard and they're not calling out to God. Now, this verse, and, and, and there are other verses like it, trouble many believers. People reason, well, if, it's, if, if God is sovereign, if everything that happens happens because God plans it, as the Bible teaches, then surely God's responsible for everything. How can God hold anyone to account for the sins that they commit if really it's, it's God who makes them do it? Now, the Apostle Paul engaged with people who said things like that. In fact, he quotes from them in Romans chapter 9. He says, why why does he still find fault? For after all, who resists his will? That's what people were saying. That's not what Paul's saying. That's what Paul is responding to. And I think Paul, when he writes that, is actually he has this passage uh, in mind. I'll not go into the reasons for that, but I think he does. And Paul's response is to counsel humility. Don't imagine, he says, that you know more than God. Don't imagine that you're kinder than God. Just think about what you say before you throw out accusations against a merciful God. That's Paul's approach. Isaiah's approach is a bit more gentle, a bit more pastoral, if you like. And we need to listen carefully to what Isaiah's actually saying here. God is a father who wants his children to come to him. He wants Israel to come to him. In spite of all that they've done, he wants them to come to him. Isaiah 1 verse 18, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's what God says. That's what God says desires. In fact, the book of Isaiah opens up with some of the saddest words in the Bible. An ox knows its master's manger. It knows where to get fed, but my people do not understand. They don't come to me. They have hardened their hearts. Isaiah 53 verse 6, 
all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us into His own way. There you have it. When Israel turned and, and sinned, God did not make them. They hardened their hearts. And what did God do in response? He let them go. He let them taste the bitter fruit of their own sin and unbelief. He hardened them. The language here reminds us of Pharaoh who hardened his heart against the Lord. God said, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, I won't. Who is this that I should? Who is this Lord? Who is this Jehovah? And God hardened his heart. That's why in the New Testament, James warns us, and the little letter to James, chapter 1, verse 13, warns us not to blame God for the choices that we have freely made. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, and then desire, when it conceives, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings death. So here we have two truths, and both of them are in the Bible. God is sovereign, and people make free choices. But let's acknowledge the problem here. Hard hearts are an obstacle. God hardens those who harden their hearts. He hands them over to darkness. But God can remove the darkness. God can take away the heart of stone. He can replace it with the heart of flesh. He can undo that obstacle. He can take it away. There is nobody who is beyond the power of grace. The most hardened sinner can be softened so that he is able, that she is able and willing to repent. And that's what Isaiah is urging here. That's, that's the subtext. That's, that's the challenge. Israel, Geelong, you, me, today, seek the Lord while He may be found. If your heart is hard, acknowledge the problem. Don't hide from it. Don't blame the preacher for saying things insensitively, though I can. If your heart is hard, go to God with that and ask Him to soften it so that you come to Him, not as, not, not, not as some religious duty, but as a needy child to a loving Father. Hard hearts are a serious obstacle. A second obstacle is, uh, I'll, I'll call it religious complacency. Uh, the, the acts of religion that people take confidence in as a substitute for repentance. Now, in these verses, Isaiah describes, certainly the opening verses, Isaiah describes the, the awesome holiness of God. The holiness that had made such an impression on Isaiah when God called him in the temple the year that King Uzziah died. We're going back here to Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah saw the Lord high and exalted and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Remember, this, this is a vision. And the angels surround Him, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So, holiness was a very real thing for Isaiah. Isaiah often describes God as, as the Holy One of Israel. And his desire was that others could have seen what he saw. Alan Harmon, in his commentary on Isaiah, points out something that most translations miss here, and that's the tense of the verbs in verse 1 there. They're past tense. They're not future. It's not, oh, that God would do something. It's, oh, that God had torn the heavens apart. Oh, that God had come down 
and that the mountains might quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water uh, to boil. And these first three verses, verses 1 to 3, describe what happens when God uh, doesn't just look down, but actually comes down uh, into the midst of nations that are opposed to Him. To make known to your adversaries that the nations might tremble at your presence. There's, a, uh, there's an echo here of Psalm 114, and I think that's very deliberate because Psalm 114 is an Exodus psalm. It describes what happened when God came down as the Israelites were standing by the Red Sea. They were helpless, and what did God do? He, he broke open the waters. And he led them through, and the Egyptians perished. God revealed his holiness and his power. And then verses 4 and 5 move on. And here, here is what happens when God uh, reveals himself to, to, to people who are, are, are willing to listen. From of old, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen a God like you who acts for those who wait for Him. You meet joyfully. Sorry. You meet Him who joyfully works righteousness. Those who remember you. And of course, remembering isn't just a casual, you know, remember God, but remembering and acting, remembering and repenting. These are people who hope for salvation. God works powerfully, just as God worked powerfully to save the children of Israel. The problem, though, is that this hasn't happened. And that's why verse 5 ends with not a statement, but a question. In our sins, we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? Not if we carry on the way we're going. See, when Jehovah, the God of Israel, did come to meet His people, what did He find? He found lots and lots and lots of religious activity, sacrifices being offered in the temple, prayers being offered from the lips. Remember that verse? Their lips are near to me, but their hearts are miles away. People flock to the festivals, but all their righteous deeds, this is a powerful phrase, were like a polluted, blood-stained garment. That's a graphic phrase, almost too graphic to describe. Not just useless religion, but offensive religion. We are like a leaf blown around by the wind. Our iniquities, unconfessed, unacknowledged, ungrieved over, make us like a leaf, worthless, blown around. Because the one thing that they ought to have done, they haven't done. There is, notice verse 7, there is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. Repentance is not happening. So, what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? It means to go to God personally. Whether you're on your knees or sitting in your chair or lying in your bed at night, the place doesn't matter. But it means going to God, acknowledging your sin, asking for mercy, not because you deserve it, but because of what Jesus, what the, the great servant of God, the sufferings, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, because of what He has done. Everyone 
who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That was, that was a verse that Peter quoted in the day of Pentecost. Then he went on to explain what that meant. Okay, how does that work? Repent. What do we need to do? Repent. Jesus said, all who come to me, I will never cast out. Anyone who comes to me acknowledging their sins, I will never cast out. So, here's a, here is possibly the greatest obstacle, refusing to repent. Here is really the only unforgivable sin. You know, people get sometimes really quite worried about that phrase that they read in the Bible, the unforgivable sin. Have I committed this, this unforgivable sin? There really is only one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that's refusing to repent. Every sin can be washed away if you ask God for mercy. Now, how does, how does Isaiah see that happening? It says, God reveals His awesome holiness. Remember, when God revealed His holiness, what did Isaiah say? I am a man of unclean lips. And the Lord took a coal, or the angel took a coal, and touched His lips. Your sins are forgiven. But maybe you're thinking, oh, all, all, all this talk about holiness and God's awesome holiness, isn't, isn't that going to frighten people away. Well, it might frighten some people away. Some people say, well, shouldn't we really put a more positive spin on God and, and, and talk about His mercy? It's, it's not an either-or. It's a, it's a both-and. You cannot separate the mercies of God from the holiness of God. It's the holiness of God that brings people to their knees, and it's on our knees that we find mercy. So, here's the second obstacle, refusing to get on our knees and ask God for mercy, and taking refuge instead in our good deeds. And there's a third one, and it's kind of the same, but it, it takes place over a longer time, and it's what I've called accumulated sins, verses 8 through to 12. Um, after all, what is it that prevents us from seeing the holiness of God? What is it that prevents us from seeing uh, the reality of our sin and, and responding to that? Well, in a word, it's the clutter, the clutter of our lives, the accumulated rubbish that builds up in our minds and in our hearts and in our habits. Recently at, at home, we uh, had a, had a, a clear-out of our garage. We've been in, in our present home now for about 12 years, and Katie, my wife, was looking for something to get it. We had to unpick uh, layers of rubbish. Well, we didn't think it was rubbish. We thought it was actually quite important, some of the stuff. But it took ages to get actually down, and it was amazing what we found in there, dead mice and, oh, yuck. It was everything in there. Twelve years of rubbish before we eventually found the thing we were looking for, or the kid he was looking for. It was enough to fill several bins. In fact, I think we're still throwing some of that rubbish out. And that's what Isaiah is describing here in verses 8 to 12. Let me explain. He, again, he speaks about God as a father. You are our father, but he's also a builder, and he's building Israel into a house. Uh, we are the clay. Now, the word for clay there uh, is often used to mean mortar as a building material. Uh, we are the mortar, and you are, the word potter there can sometimes mean potter, but it can also mean builder or maker. And I think the point here is that uh, God the Father is building Israel. We are the work of your hand. He's given them cities to live in. He's given them Jerusalem. He's given them a house uh, to worship, the temple. But instead of entering God's courts with gladness, they performed empty rituals, righteous deeds that were like filthy rags. They worshiped God with their lips, but their hearts were far away. In fact, that was the least of their problems. They even worshiped idols. They filled the place with false 
gods. It was as though they were filling God's house with rubbish. And as a result, Isaiah writes, this is before, this is before uh, Jerusalem has been destroyed. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Jerusalem has become a desolation. In fact, Isaiah makes it clear in, in verse 11, and I, and I, want, and I, want, to, I, I want to try and catch the sense uh, of, of what Isaiah is saying here, because I don't think he's talking in verse 11 about things that have taken place. He's talking about things that are just about to happen. Our beautiful and holy house, the temple where our fathers praised you, has been made ready for fire. And all our pleasant places have been made ready for ruin. You'll notice I'm offering my own translation of, uh, of, of the text here to, to try and, and get the sense. These are not past events. These are calamities waiting to happen. You know, when we, talk, when we say such and such was a, a calamity waiting to happen, it means that the, the, the warning signs have been there for years, but people ha have ignored them. Think of that tragedy in, in, in the port of Beirut where this shipload of dangerous chemicals was stored in a warehouse for years, and nobody, nobody was willing to touch it. Nobody was willing to do anything about it until a spark, and it nearly destroyed half the city. Or the fire escape in a public building, nobody maintains it. And then when the fire comes, it's, it's jammed shut. It's, it, 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 it's a fire trap, a bushland. Where the, where the leaf and the litter and the bark is built up over the years and there's been no fire, and then what happens when a fire comes? It's a big one. That's what Isaiah is, concerning, uh, is concerned about. That's what prompts his question. When the spark comes, this is going to be an utter disaster. Why do you restrain yourself? Why will you keep quiet? The obstacle isn't just a hardened heart. It isn't just uh, mistakes in, in, in worship. It's years of mistakes, accumulated rubbish in the life of the nation of Israel. So, the point I want to finish on tonight or this morning is to notice that accumulated sins build up obstacles to God's mercy. And this happens uh, over generations in families, in churches, and nations. Families don't suddenly just drop the gospel. There's often a pattern to it. You see it where you have really zealous, godly grandparents, and then children who, who kind of go along with it. They're churchgoers. They're there, but their children aren't. You see it in churches. It doesn't happen over one generation or two. Churches don't just suddenly uh, abandon the gospel. Nations don't just suddenly become post-Christian. Uncomfortable truths get ignored. False gospels gain gradual acceptance. Coldness and neglect, prayerlessness becomes normalized. Sin gathers up, and then the spark. But it's not just churches and families and nations. It's in our own life that over the years, habits build up. We're challenged by a sermon, by a verse of the Scripture. We think, yeah, I better do something about that. But we don't. In fact, we form sinful habits. We grow cold in our Bible readings. We read less and less. We end up not reading at all. We grow cold and formal and dull and repetitive in our prayers, and then we end up not praying at all. It doesn't move me anymore. And then we start forming habits 
ignoring the Lord's day, cutting the corners in our tax because everybody else does it. And yet Paul says, don't live as the Gentiles do. But you see, the more these habits build up, the harder they are to deal with, the harder it is to repent. Older generations used to say, keep short accounts with God. Now, the background to that phrase is when you went to the local grocery to get uh, uh, food to eat, and maybe you didn't get paid till the end of the week, you would, you would have it on credit. And the idea was that payday, you would come and pay off the bill. You, you sorted out your account. But what happens if you don't pay at the end of the week? And then you have the following week, and you have a whole two weeks, and then you say, oh, no, and then you have a month. No, keep short accounts with your, don't, don't get yourself into debt. The same with God. Now, it's not that we go to God and we pay off our debts. We go to God and we ask Him because of what Jesus has done, because of His perfect righteousness. Forgive me, I've sinned. I've sinned today. You don't have to wait till the end of the week to go to God and say that. Do it today. Do it the moment you sin. Do it even as you feel yourself being tempted to sin. Lord, I'm struggling here. Don't let me do this. I'm sorry that I've put myself in this place where, I, where, where I'm more vulnerable to being tempted. Keep short accounts with God. Don't let the rubbish build up in your life. Remove the obstacles that offend Him and grieve Him. Seek His mercy now. Seek Him while He may be found call upon the name of the Lord, because everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, that means repenting of our sins and trusting in Jesus, will be saved. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we, we know that we have too often delayed coming to You. Lord, we've rationalized and we've hedged and we've put it off and we've made excuses. Father, we come to You, and we thank You that You don't grudge us, You don't chide us, You don't reject us, but You receive us. And in Christ, and because of Christ, You forgive us. Father, we, I pray that if there's anyone here struggling with that decision, who hasn't come to you just yet. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Spirit in mighty power, because it's you who draw, and we pray that you would do that. Use the words that have been said today to call to yourself those who would be saved. And we pray, O oh God, that you'd help us to live close to you day by day through this week. Amen.